In this video, we'll be jumping into the second half of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and the sermon I preached from this section I called A Tale of Two Teachers. A big tool that Paul used in this section is he used the tool of contrasts uh, to show us the difference between uh, those who are true teachers, uh, the Lord's servants, and those who are false teachers, the devil's servants. As always, I encourage you to take some time to read through this passage a few times just to familiarize yourself with the text and look for key repetition, key ideas that jump out of this passage and take some time to pray and ask God to help you to understand the key things that he wants us as his people to understand from this part of his word so that we might live more effectively for him in this world. We've seen already that the overarching theme in 2 Timothy is this idea of Paul calling Timothy to finish the work of proclaiming Christ by continuing in the truth as he endures in suffering in view of the life to come. In the previous passage, the beginning of chapter 2, uh, we saw all of these elements in focus in this section as Paul was calling Timothy to stand firm in Jesus as he endured suffering, as he proclaimed this truth so that others would be saved and they would continue to stand firm in the truth until the great day when they would be with Jesus. Now, in this passage, a couple of the elements of this overarching theme are highlighted in that Paul says, keep reminding the people of these things. So, finish the work of proclaiming Christ. Keep pointing people towards Jesus. And he also speaks of it in other ways, correctly handling the truth and being able to teach. And in this passage, in a big way, this idea of continuing in the truth, it comes out as Paul speaks about this word of truth a number of times in the passage. And he speaks about those who have departed from the truth in one of the contrasts that he speaks of. Now, to see the two key characters in this section, uh, we can look right at the end of the passage here where we see Paul speaks about the Lord's servant and then he ta- speaks about the person who has been trapped by the devil to do his will. So we've got the Lord's servant here and here we've got the devil's servant. And it's quite a striking way to talk about these false teachers who Paul is putting the spotlight onto in this section. Uh, They aren't merely teaching false truth. They are actually doing the devil's will. Uh, Before we have a look at the contrast uh, between these two teachers or these two servants a little bit more, just to look at some of the repetition that we see in this passage, uh, Paul highlights a few things uh, about God. So when he says here, warn them before God, that's a very solemn a warning, a solemn charge. He's saying you want to present yourself to God as one approved. God's solid foundation stands firm. And the prayer is that God will grant these servants of the devil, these false teachers, that he'll grant them repentance. We see a few repetitions of the Lord. The Lord knows those who he is, and those who are his, those who are the Lord's, must turn from wickedness. Um, and live in a way that shows that they are the Lord's, along with the rest of those who call on the name of the Lord. So there's this important idea of the fact that we're in this together. In the previous section, Paul uh, spoke about those who don't need to be ashamed. Uh, Something that we see emerging in the book is that some of the false teachers and some people in this church in Ephesus were ashamed of Paul. Because of his chains, because of his proclamation of the gospel, he was suffering and they were ashamed of him. And now Paul is saying to Timothy, you don't need to be ashamed. Continue as a worker, someone who has been approved by God because of what Jesus has done for you. Don't be ashamed of the truth of the gospel and correctly handle the word of truth. As we've seen so far in this letter, it's helpful just to Keep an eye on the imperatives that Paul uses, so the verbs that are commands, and there are a number of them in this section. Uh, So this opening statement, uh, keep reminding God's people of these things, that's an imperative. And then there are a number of other imperatives, so 
avoid, flee, pursue, don't have anything to do with, must turn from wickedness. And all of these imperatives are focused on the Lord's servant, uh, the true teacher, the one who is correctly handling the word of truth. So keep reminding God's people of them. That will be a characteristic of a true teacher. You'll avoid godless chatter. That will be a characteristic of a true teacher. You'll turn away from wickedness. Your life will look increasingly holy. You'll flee from your evil desires of youth and rather pursue all of these Christ-like characteristics and you won't have anything to do with the devil's servant. And now in a big contrast to the true teacher, but in a big contrast to the true teacher who is uh, marked by all of these things, Paul highlights a few characteristics of the devil's servant and how they operate within the community of God's people. And I think that's one of the things to take note of. This is happening within the community. The reason we know this is because he mentions among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. And you can go and read about uh, Hymenaeus in 1 Timothy chapter 1. So 1 Timothy 1 verse 20, where we see that Hymenaeus was somebody who had been a part of God's people, but had shipwrecked his faith. And there Paul said, I've handed him over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So he was somebody who had departed from the truth. But the important thing to see, he was somebody who was within the community of God's people who had then left the truth. And we see in this passage, Paul speaks about the way that they operate in a few different ways. He speaks about them quarreling about words. And he uses the same word at the end of the passage as well. Uh, quarreling about words. They focusing on things that might be divisive or uh, might appear really interesting at first, but are actually distracting you from the truth that is all about Jesus. Uh, there's another imperative that we missed here. Do your best to present yourself to God. But these guys aren't wanting to present themselves to God. They are quarreling about words. And here he says it only ruins those who listen. Uh, the Greek word uh, for ruins here is the word katastrophe. Uh, from which we get our English word, catastrophic. Their impact on the community of God's people is catastrophic. It ruins those who listen. And so he says it's of no value and warn people, warn them before God, in the presence of God. This is a very solemn warning. Don't quarrel about words. And the contrast rather Stick to God's truth. Find teachers who are going to correctly handle God's truth, not those who are going to quarrel about words and actually end up distracting us from Jesus. Because those who quarrel about words, uh, they end up just in godless chatter. And the results are that they will become more and more ungodly. Uh, something that we see in this section is that uh, doctrine that goes wrong leads to a life that goes wrong. Doctrinal error leads to moral error. And so we see here that their teaching leads to more and more ungodliness. And he says here that it's spreading like gangrene. Uh, that's not a very pretty picture at all. To have gangrene spreading in a human body in those days was very often a deadly thing. And to have gangrene or false teaching spreading like gangrene in the body of Christ is a very terrible thing. And he says here that these teachers have departed from the truth. Instead of correctly handling the truth, the contrast is they have departed from the truth. The idea here is those who have missed the mark. It's like you're shooting an arrow, but you're aiming at the wrong target. They, they aren't aiming at the truth. They're aiming at something else. And here a specific uh, aspect of their false teaching is highlighted. They say that the resurrection has already taken place. So they are claiming that in some way uh, we are already in the glorified state of perfection where life is going perfectly for us. Health, wealth and prosperity would be uh, today's version of this. And that's what these guys were teaching. Now, they've taken the truth of the resurrection. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead. We know that as Christians we die to our sin and are raised with Christ. 
but we're still waiting for our future glorification with Christ. And these guys are claiming that that has already happened. And tragically here, we see that they destroy the faith of some. That's a terrible statement. They are destroying people's faith. But then Paul gives uh, an encouragement. He says, nevertheless, although some people's faith is being destroyed, God's solid foundation stands firm. So God's solid foundation, uh, we saw in 1 Timothy 3, where the church was spoken of as the pillar and foundation of the truth. So he's saying the church stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. And this inscription uh, comes from the Old Testament, from Numbers 16, uh, verse 5. It's in the story of Korah's rebellion against Moses, who was the leader of God's people. And that was the, the greatest challenge to Moses' leadership in those days. And Paul is saying, actually, these false teachers, their challenge to your leadership, Timothy, is uh, incredibly problematic. But then he highlights this uh, from Numbers 16, where we see the Lord knows those who are his. The Lord dealt with that rebellion in those days. And Paul is encouraging Timothy to know that God is still in charge of his church and he will keep his church. And those who are taught correctly this word of truth will be those who, who stand firm. And a result of being taught the truth uh, and then confessing the name of the Lord, saying that you're a Christian means that it will be seen in the fact that you'll turn away from wickedness. Your own life will be seen to be more and more holy. And then Paul uses an illustration here in verses 20 and 21, uh, where he speaks about things that are special or honorable or dishonorable. And he's saying those who confess the name of the Lord are those who cleanse themselves from the latter, from the dishonorable, from the false teaching that was seeping into this church. And as they cleanse themselves from this, they will be instruments for special purposes, uh, made holy, useful to the master. This is what we want to do. We want to be useful to our master and prepared to do any good work. We've seen that uh, back in Paul's letter to this church in Ephesus. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, we see uh, that God has prepared good works for his people to do. And we want to be useful to our master, doing the good works that he's prepared for us to do. And in order for that to be true of us, this word of truth needs to transform us. It shows us what to flee from. It shows us what to run to so that we'll increasingly look like our Lord. But then here he says, along with those who call on the Lord. And it's just a, a reminder that we're in this together. We need each other as we are on this race uh, for the finish line, looking to our Lord Jesus who has saved us. We need each other to help each other to flee from our evil desires, to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace as we together call on the Lord out of a pure heart, a heart that has been saved and changed by Jesus. But then quite strikingly in these final verses, uh, Paul gives Timothy as the Lord's servant some key instructions of what uh, to do with these servants of the devil. So firstly, he says, don't have anything to do with their foolish and stupid arguments. So don't, don't engage in their arguments. So don't be quarrelsome along with them. Be kind, uh, be able to teach, and not resentful. Uh, that, that word is patiently enduring evil. And then he says, how must this Lord's servant actually engage? So don't quarrel with them, but how must you engage with the, Lord's, with the devil's servant? Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance. You see, Paul wants Timothy to actually speak the word of truth to these uh, people so that they will turn, repent, and come back to a knowledge of the truth. That they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap who's taken them captive to do his will. 
So Paul does want Timothy to engage with these false teachers, all in the hope that they might turn back to Jesus. But as we'll see in the next section, in the beginning of chapter 3, uh, we see that Paul does have some very specific instructions about how else to deal with these false teachers and how to be very careful of them because they have indeed been taken captive to do the devil's will. So yes, you want, you want to instruct them in the hope that they will repent, but also be very careful so that they don't lead others astray, which is what the next section digs into more fully. But in this section, Paul just puts the spotlight on the truth. And he says that this truth about Jesus needs to be the thing that changes you so that you turn from wickedness and you flee and pursue these things. So the truth about Jesus needs to change you, but it will also equip you to spot false teaching, to see those who are quarreling about words and who are actually becoming just more and more ungodly those who are departing from the truth. You need to know the truth if you want to understand who those are who have departed from the truth. And then also it is this truth that will help us to correct those. And we correct people with the truth. We want to point people back to Jesus. And so these contrasts between these two teachers, the Lord's servant and the devil's servant, are very important for us to see. And they will help us uh, as we evaluate those who teach in the church even today, we want to make sure that those who we listen to are those, like Paul commands Timothy, who present themselves to God as those approved. They're approved because of what Jesus has done. And then you want to be a laborer, a hard worker, not ashamed, but correctly handling the word of truth as you point people to Jesus. And that's what we want to do increasingly so that others will come to a knowledge of the truth and grow in the knowledge of the truth and make it to the end still trusting in Jesus, the Lord who has saved them. Well, God bless as you dig in further.